Elections Petitions Rules 2023 and the Electoral Commission Bill of 2023. So that is the preamble, if it were, as it were, to the presentation. Look at phase one uh, and, uh, of the report and the Draft Registration of Electors Act, which is the principal component, I suggest, of the legislative framework that Sir Dennis proposes should be put in place and reflects the recommendations that Sir Dennis has made. Has made. And those recommendations, as indicated, are intended to address the cleansing of the, reg of the list or the register, the introduction of identification cards and voter, other forms of that, voter identification, and thirdly, introduction of a voter registration system. The Registration of Electors Act, the new Registration of Electors Act, I should say, that which is proposed by Sir Dennis, is divided into six parts which substantively align with the existing Registration of Electors Act and is intended to repeal and replace the existing Registration of Electors Act. The most significant parts of the Act, or the, the Bill, as, it, as I, it now should be referred to, I suppose, is, uh, certainly from a reform perspective, uh, probably parts three and five which introduce new concepts and provisions intended to give effect to the recommendations made in the report in relation to the registration of electors. So part three. Part three is comprised of clauses 6 to 34 and contain perhaps the most significant and substantive proposals as regards the um, amendments to the existing registration of electors act. And it directly impacts the cleansing of the registration of electors. The combined effect of the provisions of part three, together with the confirmation process, which is found in part five, may be described, I suggest, as constituting a verification process. The provisions of part three are set out, sorry, the provisions of part three set out requirements which must be satisfied in relation to the above. Residency is, I suggest, the first element of the verification process. And for the purposes of elections in Dominica, may be said to have two distinct components. The first of these components relates to the entitlement to be registered to vote and is reflected in, in section, sorry, in clause 71C of the new Registration of Electors Act. That is the um, bill that has been provided by Sir Dennis. This provision sets out the qualifying, qualifying requirement, namely that only if individuals who have been resident in the polling district for which they wish to be registered for at least three continuous months immediately preceding application for regist registration as an elector are able to have their names registered in the register of electors or as we say colloquially, to get registered. Clause 71C largely mirrors Section 332A of the Constitution of Dominica and Section 51D of the existing Registration of Electors Act. <coughs> the Registration, uh, sorry, there are two uh, aspects only in respect to the Registration of, the, of the Electors Act and in respect to the issue of residency. There are only really two areas that are um, of difference to the existing position. And those are, one, the uh, provision that uh, Sir Dennis um, recommends 
for 17 year olds to be um, permitted to apply for registration. Um, however, the recommendation is that they not actually be entered on the register until they attain the age of 18 years of age. And the second element um, that, is, that is new in the provisions as regards residents is a provision which would um, deem uh, state employees who are uh, stationed overseas, for example, people working in the diplomatic corps uh, for Dominica, um, they would be able uh, to have their residence deemed at a particular address, provided they have given that address to the um, chief registered officer uh, prior uh, to the, um, the, their departure. So, um, in essence, it's a deeming provision, and it's um, to address those that particular situation. So, those are the two areas in which the residency element, as it relates to the basic registration requirements, are concerned. The other um, is what is um, what would be termed the absence from Dominica. A provision. Um, those who have been following over the discussions that have taken place over the years <clears throat> will be aware that the existing Registration of Electors Act at Section 7C provides as follows. A person registered pursuant to this part shall remain registered unless and until his name is deleted from the register because he has been absent from Dominica for a period exceeding five years. That has always been interpreted as, certainly almost universally, as providing that a person who is registered, uh, if they go abroad, provided they come back at least once within a period of five years, and we're talking effectively of the five years preceding an election, that they would be entitled to vote. So Dennis's report proposes to uh, change that. Uh, it proposes that that provision be abolished and replaced with the requirement that a person would be required to spend at least 90 days, or um, he puts forward an alternative, 50 days, within a five, that same five-year period. That is found at Clause 26.1 of the New Registration of Electors Act, which states as follows. A person whose name is in the Register of Electors and who lives outside Dominica shall not be regarded as having been absent from Dominica for the purposes of Section 12b2, 13b4b, or 15.3b, if in the five-year period immediately preceding the date of the last publication of the Register of Electors, the person visited and remained in Dominica for a period of at least 90 slash 50 days, or for periods amounting in the aggregate to at least 90 slash 50 days. Clause 26, one, as would be evident from what I've just read, as will, would have, or will have, if it's um, enacted, a consequential impact on the new, new clause 12b2, which would replace section 7 of the existing act by reducing the right of registered individuals to remain on the register. And secondly, it would impact new clauses 13.4b and 15.3b by increasing the number of people who would lose their right to remain registered and therefore would have their names removed from the register of electors. The second element of the verification process, I suggest, is what can be put under the heading of registration. Registration is addressed in the new um, draft registration of Electors Act at clauses 7 and 9.1. Those two clauses are essentially the same as sections 5 and 8.1 of the existing registration of Electors Act. And they do not alter the existing requirements in relation to registration uh, um, significantly. 
The third element is identification cards. Uh, that, as we, we all know, has been an issue. Um, the Sir so Dennis's report proposes that man, um, identification cards are to be used at all elections as a mandatory requirement. That will be a change because, as it currently stands, the law provides in section, section 19 of the existing Registration of Electors Act that uh, identification cards can be used. But it says that the chief registering officer may use. So it's, a, it's um, not obligatory. But it now would become, by way of Clause 11 of the new uh, Registration of Electors Act, it would become a mandatory requirement for identification cards to be used at all elections in Dominica. And Clause 11, for, um, just for information, um, says, where a person has been duly registered as an elector, the chief registering officer shall cause a national identification card in the prescribed form and containing the prescribed information to be issued to the person in accordance with the regulations. Two, the chief registering officer may designate locations for the purpose of the issue of national identification cards. And three, there shall be established and maintained by the chief registering officer a rule of the names of persons to whom both um, national identification cards have been issued. There has been some dispute as to whether the, this ID card should be called a voter identification card or a national identification card, but there are also those who are of the view that this is a non-issue. Um, for the purposes of um, the um, discussion, and certainly um, for the purpose of ensuring that a person who votes at an election is a person who is entitled to vote, uh, that the point that um, Sir Dennis is addressing is making the use of identification cards mandatory. Um, the fourth element of the uh, verification process that I identify is investigation. And that is the new or the proposed new um, Registration of Electors Act would increase the authority of the chief registering officer and the electoral officials to um, secure, well, to request, seek, and secure um, information necessary to ensure that the list contains only the names of those people who are lawfully entitled to be on it. Clause 9 of the new Registration of Electors Act largely reflect, reflects Section 8 of the existing Act, except for two new provisions, which are as follows. Which, sorry, which give um, elections, one gives election officers greater discretion as to the nature of the information they are authorized to require from an occupier of a building, and that's at um, Clause 9.4. And the other is that it creates a new offense of refusing to, to furnish information requesting or providing false information to the chief registering officer or electoral um, officials. And that is found at clause 9.5 of the um, new Registration of Electors Act. The second um, component of the investigate, new investigatory powers is at clause 10. And in uh, clause 10, it is uh, an, an entirely new provision that was not in the existing legislation, um, and it expressly empowers the chief registering officer to carry out investigations for the purpose of verifying details provided to electoral office officials and in electoral records and to gather new information where necessary. The third element is, uh, again, a new um, innovation pr proposed by Sir Dennis. That is at clause 27 of the new, uh, new uh, Registration of Electors Act. And it proposes the introduction of a provision that would oblige various public officials to provide to the chief registering officer information within specified timelines. The requirements of clause 27 will include the following. The permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs must no later than the 30th of May every year submit to the chief registering officer a report containing as at the date of the report, 
the name of every person who is one in the service in service overseas, two a registered elector or eligible to be, and three who is no longer in service overseas. Another um, requirement, and there are several, but I only list two, is that the chairman of the Mental Health Review Board will not later than the 15th day of the month, following each quarter, ensure that the following details are provided regarding each person who has been certified as having a mental disorder as defined under the Mental Health Act. And that information is to be provided to the Chief Registering Officer, namely the name, the street address, the date of birth, and the occupation of any person in that category, i.e. a person who has been certified as having a mental disorder. The Mental Health Act defines mental disorder as mental illness or mental deficiency, however caused or manifested. And that is found in Section 2 of the Mental Health Act, which is in Chapter 40, 62 of the laws of Dominica. That may be an interesting um, uh, issue, uh, but we will see as the consultation process unfolds. The fifth um, element of the verification process is another new um, feature. It is found at part five of the new registration of electors act um, and sets out the process involved and what is required of those whose names are registered in the Register of Electors and are desirous of having their names remain in the Register. This part authorizes the Electoral Commission to declare a period during which the confirmation shall take place. Secondly, to facilitate the confirmation of registration of persons who are overseas during the confirmation period. Thirdly, to ensure that adequate resources are made available to carry out the confirmation process in an efficient and timely manner. And fourthly, to prescribe regulations to give full effect to the provisions of the Registration of Electors Act relating to the confirmation of registration of electors. Any elector who fails to present his or herself for confirmation or presents his or herself but is unable to satisfy the Chief Registering Officer that he or she is entitled to be confirmed will have his or her name removed from the Register of Electors. Um, that, in a nutshell, means that um, even if one is already um, on the Register of Electors, if at some point uh, the um, Electoral Office, the Chief Registering Officer, declares a confirmation period and the, um, the, the um, proposed legislation requires the uh, Chief Registering Officer to do that within a short period uh, after the, um, the Act would come into effect, then that would require everybody to um, basically re-register. Re um, it's a confirmation, so if you're already on the list, you would have to present yourself and conform with the requirements um, to have your name confirmed on the register so that you could remain. And if you fail to do so, your name would be removed. Part four is um, dealing with miscellaneous matters. Um, essentially, it provides for offences and penalties, some which are new, um, that will attach to various actions. And it also provides provision for the circumstances in which and the restrictions upon disclosure, um, which would be subject to an order of the court. So that is a new, um, uh, would be a new uh, development, and it's an important one, and one to be noted, because what it would provide is that um, the chief registering officer could disclose information um, of any elector, and that would include biometric um, information and, and personal details. But that could only be done uh, by a process which is set out in some detail. And if you look at the, um, the, the um, uh, I think it's 20, section 26, I believe, you look at it, it sets it out in, in detail. And what it allows is for um, uh, an authorized person which is de defined in the, in the um, proposed legislation to make an application to a, a judge of the High Court. Um, and if the judge of the High Court is satisfied and issues an, uh, an, or an order um, authorizing the disclosure, then the disclosure could take place. But in the absence of such an order by the court, which has to be uh, substantiated by an affidavit and other processes of the court, no such dis disclosure could take place. 
So that really um, summarizes uh, as, um, phase one of uh, Sir Dennis's report. Phase two, um, trying to run through it quickly. Um, phase two of the report, um, Sir Dennis indicated that uh, this seeks primarily to address institution, what he refers to as institutional matters. Um, and as I indicated earlier, phase two is accompanied by four pieces of draft legislation, the four piece, pieces I mentioned earlier. Perhaps the most substantive recommendations from the phase two, uh, from phase two of the report are reflected in the House of Assembly Elections Act 2023, which um, I refer to as the new House of Assembly Elections Act. And the, these, are, these are namely uh, uh, are to be found primarily at um, Clause 50 of Part 3, which deals with access to the media. Uh, part 4, which deals with use of electronic voting systems for the purpose of voting. And Part 5, which deals with campaign financing. These are all new provisions and, and uh, would introduce new aspects to Dominica's voting system. Um, The main issues addressed by these new provisions are as follows. Access to the media, which I have indicated is at Clause 50. Clause 50, the access to the media would pr propose a substantive change um, and it would introduce a mandatory requirement um, for political parties and independ independent candidates to be uh, granted access to state-owned media during the campaign period. So effectively, it would give political parties and independent candidates an entitlement to be um, allowed to have access um, and air their views um, on state-owned media. Note, it's uh, confined, insofar as Sir Dennis's um, recommendation is concerned, to state-owned media and not private media. The report proposes that access be on the principles of total impartiality non-discrimination and equal time. And it also proposes that the Electoral Commission will be required to monitor the equitable airtime and issue directives as necessary to media agencies. And um, section, sorry, clause 54 of the new, act, new um, proposed act defines um, campaign period. Um, and for the purposes of time, I will not um, read out what I have here, but you can look at it if you um, turn to clause 54 either now or subsequently. Part 4, um, which is, is, com is comprised of clauses 51 to 53, deals with ele electronic voting and so the report um, recommends that um, elections should be conducted by means of approved electronic voting systems. However, there are a number of conditions and criteria that are set out uh, by Sir Dennis in his report which would need to be satisfied before it would be appropriate, in his view, for electronic voting systems to be <coughs> utilized for the purposes of elections. And, and this, of course, is a matter which um, can, and I suspect w will, form part of the deliberations during the consultancy. Part five, which is clause 54 to 75, deal with political campaign financing and um, as I indicated, this is a substantive change from the existing um, landscape and so far as the political system is concerned. So Dennis made the following observation in relation to campaign financing as follows. The regulation of political and, sorry, of the regulation of political and campaign financing is not new to the Commonwealth Caribbean. Elements of regulation of campaign finance can be found in the legislation of some countries in the region, although the only one to have enacted a comprehensive regulatory framework is Jamaica. Close quote. So Dennis's observation notwithstanding, the proposals contained in this part would without doubt be an entirely new introduction to the electoral landscape in Dominica and would necessarily involve a careful consideration and debate. The recommendations would provide the following for governing the sources from which political parties and candidates can obtain funding and the limits to be placed upon contributions to, expenditure by, and use, use made uh, of those um, funds by political parties and candidates.
Clause 54, sorry, clauses 54 to 63 um, deal explicitly with campaign contributions and the limits um, to those what constitute acceptance, um, what, in what circumstances um, the recipient would be re required to return those funds, um, failing which there would be consequences, um, what, in what circumstance those funds uh, could be forfeited, the permissible uses that can be made of those funds, and the record keeping that the political parties and uh, candidates um, must um, comply with in order to conform with the new proposed legislation. Clauses 64 to 65 deal with, uh, expressly with campaign expenditure and really just deals with the limits that are placed upon those. Clauses 66 to 75 are of a general uh, impact in relation to campaign financing. Um, and they really deal, I suppose, the main feature is that they deal with submission of reports and audited returns and the publication of reports by the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission is give, will be given the authority to publish those reports if it so chooses. Important also in that, um, that part uh, of the, of the um, proposed legislation dealing with campaign finances are clauses 57 free, 64 free, and 64 4, 68 4, 69 free, and 69 4, and clause 70. Those um, clauses deal, they propose the creation of offenses and maximum penalties, um, to, which could be imposed in relation to those um, offenses. And those penalties range from $6,000 or 12 months in prison which would be applicable to clause 57 free to $10,000 um, which would be applicable to clause 64, clauses 64 free, 69 free and 69 four and $10,000 or 12 months imprisonment which would be applicable to clause 70. Part seven which comprises clauses 91 to 94 deals with election petitions, and largely it reflects the existing position as regards election petitions, save that um, Sir Dennis has um, provided a draft House of Assembly election petitions rules, which um, is the report proposes should be adopted and, and used as the rules uh, which govern uh, election, pet or would govern election petitions on if the um, bill were enacted. Uh, at least until the Chief Justice revokes or amends um, those provisions. And um, six, the deals, which is the final provision that I'm going to deal with, deals with the Electoral Commission, and the report makes recommendations for changes to be made in relation to the Electoral Commission. The pr principle among these are that the, electoral, the um, proposed introduction of an Electoral Commission Act 2023 which um, it is pr proposed would govern the operation and function of the Commission. Um, the proposed um, introduction of a greater level of financial autonomy for the Commission, uh, that's dealt with at Clause 12 and of the um, um, Electoral Commission Act, and it proposes the establishment of the Electoral, co of a, the Electoral Commission Fund and for annual payments of a specified amount into the fund and for administration by the fund, uh, uh, sorry, of the fund by the um, chief elections officer. The, um, it will also provide for staffing. Clause 8 proposes autonomy to the commission in the appointment of staff and also it proposes um, a mandatory requirement for members of the commission or of any committee established by the Commission, the Chief Elections Officer or any employee of the Commission to be required to disclose any private interest that he or she has in relation to a matter that is being considered. And, sorry, and that is found at Clause 19 of the um, Electoral Commission Act. So in a nutshell, um, that is a, a, a summary of the 
rec the recommendations and the provisions of the draft legislation proposed by Sir Dennis. Um, there are other matters, some of which um, others may consider to be um, significant, but those are, those are the matters that I consider to be of um, greatest significance and um, necessary to share with you this evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Attorney General, for the brief overview of the recommendations. Um, before I open up the floor, uh, I would want to perhaps uh, introduce to you the, um, our guests who are here representing the various organizations that I spoke about. Um, this is the first time we're having the consultation, so I think it would be appropriate to let you know now um, who they are and perhaps invite them to say a few words. Um, Honorable Mr. Justice Am Raphael Masaga is a retired judge of the Court of Appeal of Kenya. In addition to his distinguished years of service at the bar and bench, Justice Misaga chaired the Judiciary Committee on Elections leading to the 2017 general elections in Kenya and has handled many election petitions, including the presidential election petition in 1997 and the Nairobi governor election petition in 2017. He is here to represent the Commonwealth Secretariat. Justice Masaga, I know that it was a very long journey for you to come here to Dominica, and we are very grateful for your presence. Please, can you come and share with us a few words? Your Excellency, the Prime Minister, distinguished guests, good evening. Um, my name has already been pronounced by the chair of the session. I come from Kenya, East Africa. I'm a retired judge of the Court of Appeal after serving for in the judiciary for 35 years and also in the private practice for 10 years. So the total number of years in the legal profession is actually 45 years. As rightly pronounced, I dealt with so many electoral matters and it's my pleasure to share my experience with you. I'm a nominee of the uh, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, and I'll be happy to sit and listen to the liberations of the wonderful people of Dominica, and wish you all the best. From what I've read, this is people-driven, and I think you all have the passion to make sure that at the end of the day, it shall impact positively to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Mishaga. I also wish to introduce you to Ms. Meline Glean from the OS, who has more than 20 years' experience in international relations, diplomacy, and political analysis with a focus on the Caribbean region. She has worked in the OS Secretariat for Strengthening the Democracy since 2014, advising on political trends and developments in CARICOM member states of the OAS, OAS and supporting the development and deployment of OAS electoral observer missions in several CARICOM states. I believe she was here for the last elections in Dominica. Ms. Glynn, could you please say a few words? Thank you, Ms. Barron. Good evening, everyone. I was indeed here for the general elections in 2022. I was the deputy chief of that mission, and I was also deputy chief for our mission in 2019. It is good to be here once again. I bring you greetings from the OS Secretary General. We are pleased to have this opportunity to collaborate with Dominica once more and we look forward to listening to what you have to say and taking our, our results back to the OS Secretary General. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Glynn. Mr. Sas Raj represents the CARICOM Secretariat. He's an attorney at law in private practice at the Guyana Bar. He has been a commissioner of the Guyana Elections Commission from 2015 to present. He was a member of the UNASOR, the Union of South American Nations Electoral Observer Mission in Bolivia in 2015, a member of the CARICOM Electoral Observer Mission in St. Lucia in 2021, and Chief of Mission for the CARICOM Elections Observation Mission to St. Kitts and Nevis in 2022. So, Mr. Lugonrat, please. Good evening, all. Uh, 
protocol having been established allow me to adopt it, please. It gives me great pleasure to participate in this consultative process with Dominica as a nominee of the CARICOM Secretary, Secretary General. Uh, from our perspective in terms of the GAN experience, this is a road that we have walked in terms of legislation and legislative, legislative changes. And as many of you would also know, from a, an electoral perspective, we've had our challenges. That being said, we look forward to participating in this process with the people of Dominica, and we wish you well in these proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gunraj. And last but by no means least, Mr. Dwight Lay represents the OECS Commission. He's a barrister and has functioned as a legal representative of the government of St. Lucia, locally, regionally, and internationally. He has professional experience in both the theory and practice of regional and international trade and public administration, and he's currently the general counsel of the OECS. Mr. Lay, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to everyone. Uh, protocol has been established, and I would like the opportunity to adopt it. Uh, these proceedings uh, are very important for the OECS, from the perspective of the OECS as a regional institution. And we see what's taken place in Dominica as a good example for other member states of, of the, the, the sub-region. Uh, we do appreciate uh, the sensitivity of the issue and the varying interests which are all at stake and uh, will be, I guess, articulated and settled in, in the process. Uh, the Director General of the OECS and the member states are uh, uh, also, a, a, I, I think, observing this very keenly. And on behalf of the organization, uh, I would like to say that we are, in fact, very uh, uh, happy to be observers at this uh, process because it will assist us in moving forward as, as a, a regional institution uh, which has the interest of its member states at heart. Uh, so we look forward to the next couple of days and would be very uh, interested in the proceedings that will be taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you. And, and we're very pleased to have you here in Dominica. Uh, you would have heard from the Attorney General a synopsis of some of the key points arising from the report of Sir Dennis. Um, some of you may be happy with the report. Some may think it goes too far. Some may think that it does not go far enough. You will all have the opportunity to share your views and perspectives on this and to say to the government what you would like to see be taken to the parliament to modernize our electoral process. You, you would see that the government is very much interested in what you have to say. The prime minister is here, his cabinet ministers are here as well. So um, I know that we are joined by persons online um, and the persons in the room, members of the Bar Association, uh, the persons who are online can always raise their hand so that they can indicate if they wish to um, make any comments. Uh, we would like everyone to have an opportunity to speak, so we ask that you keep your intervention succinct and to the point so that everyone will get a chance to speak. Everybody's view is important and we ask that we all show respect and allow people to share their views uninterrupted. Because there are several issues arising out of Sir Dennis's recommendations, I propose that we deal with the main issues one by one. And thereafter, if there are other matters that you wish to raise arising out of his report, then you can do so. Uh, please be reminded that as well that you also have the opportunity to submit your comments and feedback in writing. Um, and if you wish to do so, they can be sent to Ms. Karen Prevo, the Cabinet Secretary, at the Cabinet Secretariat the sixth floor of the Financial Center on Kennedy Avenue. Uh, I wish to um, invite the, uh, Mrs. Didier Knight, if she, has, if she wants to share the, um, the position of the 
of the Dominica bar on the recommendations of Sir Dennis. If she is minded to do so now, she she can you're invited to do so if there if there is um, the position of the bar that you would want to share with us. So this is my idea. Thank you, Mrs. Baron Roy. Um, protocol has been established already. I will adopt it, save that I will acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Prime Minister and the Ministers of Government. Um, Madam Chairperson, the Bar Association, as an association, does not have a position on the legislation, on the proposed legislation. We have not met and sat and, and come to any consensus on this the proposed legislation. I think um, probably it would be almost impossible, <laughs> I think, to have lawyers with analytical minds, independent minds, to actually sit and come to an agreement on and have a, a joint position on this matter. But having said that, I know that individual lawyers do have their position, and I think that everyone who comes to the podium this evening and expresses their position, that those would be their personal views and not necessarily the views of the Dominican Bar Association. I also note that every single member of the bar was invited to this evening's consultation and not solely the bar association. Um, for those who don't know, and, and until we have the Legal Profession Act passed, hopefully it will be sooner rather than later, not every member of the bar is a member of the bar association. So that some, some members of the bar are not, and so they can come and give their position. Every member of the bar can simply come and give their position on the act. Yes, yes, you're smiling at me, I'm not sure why. <laughs> okay, and having said, I do have my own personal views on the legislation, but I know that there are lawyers here who are more senior than I am, and in the tradition of the profession, I would certainly allow them to proceed before I do. I see Mr. Richards is there, Mr. Stowe is there, who are more senior than I do than I am. I also see online Ms. Um, Lisa De Freitas, who is also more senior than I am, Ms. Augustus. I see Mr. Astefan, of course, SC is present. So I will allow them first, and then I will step in in my turn. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, we, we have mics available, so if anybody indicates their interest in uh, making a presentation, then the um, person will bring the mic to you. Uh, as I indicated, to ensure that we capture all of the points, we, we want to take them point by point. So um, the Attorney General would have spoken about the qualification for registration and remaining registered. And a number of uh, issues arise here. And I will just name a few, you may have others. Uh, the question of the removal of persons from the register who have been absent from Dominica for more than five years. Should the five-year restriction be removed altogether? Should it be 10 years? What should constitute absence? 90 days, 50 days, five days? Should there be any restriction at all? I'm just putting those questions out there so that it can tease your mind when you, uh, when you get up to, to make your presentation. Uh, the Attorney General spoke about the feedback, well, allowing 17-year-olds to register. Um, and so as soon as they become 18, their registration would take effect. Uh, he also spoke about a new register to be created and to avoid disenfranchising persons already on the register, a confirmation process will take place. So questions can arise, should all confirmations take place in Dominica? Should the Electoral Commission go to Dominicans in different cities? Should confirmation be allowed by virtual means? Uh, so these are just some of the questions. Should identification cards for voting be mandatory? Should the ID cards be solely for voting or should they be multi-purpose? So these are just some of the questions um, that arise. So I'm not sure if anybody wants to take the floor to speak to any of those issues. Uh, it can be here or virtually. So the floor is open. Mr. Gildan Richards, can you bring the mic to him? The Attorney General is here as well if you require any clarification on any matters. Good evening, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, and I'm not sure the mic is, is working. Um, is it on? Madam Chairman, good evening, Honorable Prime Minister, 
Ministers of Government, invited guests. Do they account for me? Um, sorry. Okay, great. I um, pleased to be here to make my humble contribution to this consultation. Madam Chairman, I start with the House of Assembly elections recommendation. Madam Chairman, my first concern is in Clause 11. I think Clause 11 refers to the issuance of the rate. I don't know if it can be shown on the screen. Uh, go ahead. Um, they will try to put it up on, on the screen. Maybe you can just say what Clause 11 says. Madam Chairman, I said Chairman, Madam Chairwoman. I believe there should be a fixed date for election at a fixed month every five years. I believe that is one of the most fundamental changes we need to make if we are going to have true control as a people of our election process. I do not believe, and it's not personal than we see, I do not believe the Prime Minister should hold election dates in his pocket or his convenience to be declared whenever he so chooses. Anybody can see the unfairness in this because the Prime Minister is likely to choose the day that is most suitable to him but most inconvenient results. I pray that we give serious consideration to this recommendation. And Joan, identification cards and not national identification cards are the only parts which are truly within the, jurors, the constitutional authority of the Electoral Commission. That is the card that Justice Barrett should have recommended and not Nigel National Identification Card. The reason is simple. The complications are clear. First, to permit the Electoral Commission to make an issue national identification card is to transfer to it a jurisdiction that rightly belongs to some other part of government. The Electoral Commission is not responsible for citizenship, nor is it responsible for immigration. This is a critical point. Further, the Electoral Commission has no jurisdiction to issue such a card because it cannot choose, as Justice Byron observed, to issue the card to which all citizens are entitled to only those citizens who are entitled to vote. And, Madam Chairman, we recall the first attempt to pass in our parliament legislation to that effect. I was the person who filed the injunction prior to its reintroduction, the reintroduction of the bill parliament, for good reason. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like us to refer to the first phase report at page 22, 25 or 
And there you will see that Justice Barrier raises the same issues, almost identical, that I rose in those, in those proceedings in relation to the difficult issue of imposing on the Electoral Commission an unconstitutional duty to make and pursue national identification rights. Therefore, it is in your understanding I just finally recommend national identification that after he has made some strong point against it on that page of the report. I respect Justice Byron very much. But I think in this regard, he has made a fundamental error. Madam Chairwoman, I have other points that I can make. Now, I don't want to dominate this proceeding. So I will sit for us to digest the, the issues that I have um, given air to. Because these are the fundamental issues. And I propose respectfully, and I hope the Prime Minister can understand. I don't know if you will look at me and see. You can understand, Mr. Prime Minister, the grave difficulty we will have to prepare the necessary legislation that must involve an amendment of the Constitution by way of referendum to get a national identity process going before the next election. And I hope the visitors here from abroad who are here you will make a particular note in this regard because this is a burning issue for all Americans. The Electoral Commission now, today, in law, has the jurisdiction to issue national identities and voter identities. If you look at Regulation 15 of the existing law, Registration of Areas and Regulations, you will see that it caters for identification time. The parent law permits identification times to be made. Regulation 15 says, when required, Voter ID card has been required in since the last five elections, if not more. It's only an amendment of the existing law to give it that effect. Again, as the Prime Minister, I'm urging you to do what I'm sure you know is right. So just to be clear, Mr. Um, Richards, yes. you are in favor of identification cards being used for yes. elections. Yes. But you're, you're a favoring voter, voter ID cards, cards as opposed to national ID yes, cards. Yes, voter ID okay. cards are the only I get you. cards the Commission has to be I understand your point. So I rest for your digestion of this point because this is the main point that we should make. Okay. And make all the points. You can but always come in later to make other points. We go into the next election mm -hmm. without giving effect to the laws and the book now. And cleaning the, cleaning the votes list is another one. The law is there. It's the enforcement of the law that is being delayed, and is being delayed by a denial of resources to the Electoral Commission to do simple things for us to have free, transparent, and honest election. Thank you for your contribution. Please note that, uh, that all your comments are being recorded, so they, they, they're being taken note of. I believe we have online Jeffrey Douglas Murdoch. Can you come in? Can you unmute and come in, please, and let us have your comments? Yes, Yes, my absentee ballot. So I'm wondering, you put a teaser out there as to, you know, should we consider a time frame for when Dominicans are in Dominica? Well, my, my right to vote in America has not been abridged by being out of America for 40 years. So I'm just wondering what's the consideration there, why there even be a, a, a 
constraint on how much time you get away from dominating. Thank you, um, Mr. Murdoch. Well, that's the, one of the things that we have to discuss here, whether there should in fact be a constraint or not. Um, I think Senior Counsel Astafan wants to come in. Yes, Mr. President. I'm very happy with what Mr. Jeffrey just said, because recent events, oh, but first of all, forgive my when it went by my uh, I abided the protocol. I I wish I want to thank the observers for coming back. I want to invite the Prime Minister for inviting them. I'm happy they're here based on what their introduction. I will say clear to me that they have clear knowledge of the actual law. Um, I recall Mr. Bradley from Zenusha. I am very sorry I'm not in Dominico. I would have loved to have spoken to the judge from Kenya about his election petition matter. And then I could discuss my meeting that I had since 2005. But we had as it is. Um, I want to start with what Mr. Murdoch said. And Mr. Murdoch has a, a point that we have to consider, even if some may not like it. In 2009, I think it was, sentences moved away from the so criteria for registration in the United And created, how should I put it, a ground for registration of what they call domicile. Because their constitution as well as ours require residence for domicile for the purposes of registration. And once registered, you have the right to vote, regardless of how long it goes. And I'll get to that in a minute. Domicile incentives meant that if you lived in the country before you traveled to the diaspora, you have a right under the legislation to register in the constituency in which you decided before you left. And even if you were born in New York, and never as a child decided to say it's a means. Domicile included or gave the right to the citizen, because it's very efficient, the right to register either in the constituency in which you mother lived, or mother lived, and if she was never a citizen of St. Louis, then the father would have decided. That was very united. In recent times, we have seen Commonwealth countries like Britain, for our United States, removing the 15 year rule on the right to vote. Canada removing the 5 year list, the 5 year rule to vote. To, to, to Australia has done the same thing. I, I don't know what was the position in Africa, so we are soon find out. And the developing international best practice is to give the right to citizens to vote, to vote. Either in the constituency in which they may have lived before, the travel or how it belongs to their
Just to conclude on that point, so Mr. Richards, you're agreeing with Mr. Richards that the law as it stands could have led to a cleansing of the list. Now, Sir Dennis has suggested additional changes uh, to help that process along. Do you have any comments on the additional changes that he has, he has introduced? For example, uh, a positive requirement on public officials to provide information to the Electoral Commission. Any recommendations?
Before you, before you go back, um, Gilman, is there anybody else that wants to speak to any of these points? Online? Mr. Richards, you have the floor. I just want to respond to the very Can we have the mic, please? eloquent contribution made. Right? One second. Yes, I'm okay. I've listened to Mr. Arsipan, and I don't think he's serious when he says that Parliament makes the law and not the Commission. I think he really misses the point fundamentally. This Parliament can contravene the Constitution. And the Constitution specifically says what the Electoral Commission can do. It definitely means that you cannot, by ordinary legislation, impose a duty on the Electoral Commission. You must amend the Constitution, and Justice Byron makes the point at page 25 of his first phase report. I wish we could have it on the screen to see. The enormous difficulty okay, it entails to get that process done before the next session. I don't think that's exactly the point that um, senior counsel made, but but please, but, please, but, please, but please. the point is this. Do the point is the, the, the point is he this, um, Mr. Richards, if I may. Yes. The the point is whether or not we should have an ID card for elections, and I think you agree that we should have ID cards. Your disagreement is in what as to whether it should be national voter ID cards or national ID cards and your point has been taken well, well, that you I'm, that you're saying that it cannot be national ID cards that it should be voter ID cards. So I've taken that point. Madam Chairman, I yes. certainly believe you agree to me. But you said so before. Yeah they know. Yeah. Okay. You have missed the point just like this it is a violation of the constitution to impose upon the electoral commission any other duty than those duties, those duties that are specific to election. I understand that. The issuance and making of national ID is not within that ambit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on the question of the, the confirmation process, the, the, does anyone have any comments in relation to that? Sorry. Um, I think we can see why we don't have a joint statement. Huh? <laughs> Madam Chair, with, with your permission, I will just give my general comments on the, on the entire thing as I have prepared it. Firstly, Madam Chairperson, I wish to commend Sir Dennis and his team for their time their effort and work put into the research and consultation process and the report and the draft laws. It is indisputable, indisputable, I would say, that by and large the draft laws represent what can be seen as a significant progression in our electoral laws. For example, the laws proposed to take our, the propositions proposed to take our electoral laws from a position of saying nothing at all on the issues of campaign financing and campaign expenditure to introduce a new provision specifically dealing with these issues and placing limits on same. This is commendable. To the extent that the 
800 or so people who participated in the survey represent a snapshot of Dominican society, these provisions were highly desired by the populace and they are here. We should adopt them. Other highly desirable outcomes from the survey were, among other things, the cleansing or the sanitization of the voters' list, voter identification, and the issue of treating and bribery. With regard to the latter, although the specific question of the transportation of voters into Dominica from overseas was not a question specifically asked in the survey, it is well known, I would say, I would posit, that this is a matter on the minds of many Dominicans. It has formed a part of various election petitions, protests, etc. So I wish to speak to these few issues and to put my queries and suggestions. Before that, however, I would say, Madam Chairperson, that my overarching recommendation today, really, or this evening, is that this type of forum, we can get general ideas. But I do not think that we can take from this forum real specific, concrete recommendations on every aspect of the law. I think time doesn't allow it. The, the situation, the circumstance doesn't allow it. And my recommendation would be for a committee to be formed, comprising of at least one or two representatives from civil society organizations and the political parties to really take an in-depth review of the legislation and propose any changes to go through it line by line, roll up your sleeves. As a friend of mine would say, roll up your sleeves and get to work and go line by line on that legislation and see what can be done or what needs not to be done. And the committee would, of course, I believe, bring forward contributions from members of their respective organizations. If I could address first the cleansing of the voters list. There are two options for cleansing the voters list. We have, can have a re-registration process or confirmation process. As we see, the draft laws propose the latter, a confirmation process. And that confirmation process is set out in part five of the Registration of Electors Act and the regulations. Based on the process, the, conf the confirmation of deceased persons, I would say, should be almost impossible, except in the case of serious fraud. Regulation 53.2C, however, states that an applicant for confirmation will be disallowed if the applicant, being a citizen of Dominica, has been absent from Dominica for a period of more than five years as determined pursuant to the provisions of the Act. And we have just seen that the definition of being absent from Dominica for more than five years is that 90 days, whether you have spent an accumulation of 90 days within the country or 50 days, Sir Dennis is suggesting, either 50 or 90. As to the issue of whether that provision should be there or not, that the issue of absence, when I reviewed the report and I reviewed the surveys, this was not an issue that people opposed, that they didn't want persons who were, it is not that people opposed that part of our legislation that said persons who were absent from Dominica for five years should not be permitted to vote or should, be, should not be permitted to vote. People were not opposed to that part of our legislation. So it is there. I think Sir, Sir Byron is simply trying to clarify it and to clarify the definition of what absence is. According to his report, that is the vexing issue. Not a question of whether they should be permitted to vote or not, but what does absence mean? I think that is what he got from all of his consultations, surveys, and so on with the populace. So if that is the issue, the question then really is, is that the, do we like that definition of being absent, meaning not being in Dominica for an accumulation of 90 days or 50 days? I think it's fine, in my personal view. I think the 90-day provision is fine. Persons may argue that, well, people contribute to the finances and that provision should not be there at all. I don't think that that was a question that Dominicans really was, was bothered with. They didn't have an issue with it at all. It was just the meaning of what is absence. Is it one day? If you come to Dominica for one day during a period of five years, is that sufficient? No, I think Sir Byron, in his consultations, realized that it needed more than one day. He suggested 50 to 90, and I think that that is fine. What I am concerned with, Madam Chair, is that the regulations do not provide the sufficient particulars of the requirements to show that you are disallowed under the section, under the section dealing with absence from Dominica. So the regulations provide a form, Form 31, 
and that form requires a statement as to one's residency. So under the confirmation process, you fill up a form and you say why you should be, you should remain on the register. And that form gives you one, one of the questions is to your residential status. And you simply put in there what your residential status is. And I think that that's all the regulations say in relation to that. And I suppose it is hoped that there will be a level of honesty there to say, I am not resident in Dominica, I am resident overseas, which would then allow the registering officer, the confirmation officer to ask for the questions. But I don't think our legislation should, should rely on one's honesty only. That's why we have legislation. So I think that the legislation or in that form, there should be more probing questions as to one's residency and to one's absence from the state. And some of those probing questions could be, do you have a second citizenship? Do you have a residency status, not only in Dominica, but outside of Dominica? Because persons can reside in two places, or you can have, yeah, you can reside in two places. And those questions, I think, if those questions were on the form, it would lead then to the registering or the confirmation officer asking for more information or seeking, for instance, one's passport. I mean, why is there an absence, really, of a requirement for a passport if you reside in this sense? So if we agree and if we are saying that that requirement is okay, that requirement of absence from Dominica for more than five years is okay, and we agree with that and we accept that, then to ensure that when the confirmation comes in, you confirm yourself on the register, you must provide proof of it. There must be some provision of proof of it. It cannot just be filling up a form and saying where you reside. There must be some mandatory requirement to show that you have not been absent from the state for more than five years. And from what I can see, the legislation doesn't provide for that, and it ought to. And also that form, that form 31, we notice as well that it is not a, a declaration. So when you apply to register to, be, to, to vote, to be on the list, to be on the register of electors, the form is actually a declaration. And there's a notice at the bottom which tells you if you put anything in there that is false, then you could be liable to be imprisoned and so on and so forth. I think it's an offense. That declaration is not on the confirmation form. And I think it ought to be there in Form 31. It ought to be there. It ought to be a declaration. It is not required that it is um, witnessed like the registration form. I'm not sure why. Probably it ought to be witnessed, but it certainly ought to be a declaration and there ought to be that provision there that says if you say anything on the form that is not true, that you will be liable to be, that it would be an offense. And we note at rule or in the regulations, regulation 27.1e, that this is the section that deals with the Electoral Commission being able to ask for records from the registry, from the minister, from the permanent secretary, and so on. And those are mandatory requirements. So in other words, it says, I don't know if we can put it up, Regulation 27, it says that the, the chief electoral of the Electoral Commission can, or they, they, they may ask for records, or that they shall they shall receive records from the registry, they shall receive records from the permanent secretary, and so on, and this is re with regard to deaths, births, absence from the state, and so on. But in relation to the immigration records, we see that there's no mandatory requirement. It doesn't use the word shall, it uses the word may. So it says that the officer may request this information of the immigration authorities, and we wonder why that that one is not mandatory, where all the rest are. Again. If we are going ahead with the absence requirement, with the, re the, the, require the, 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 the absence definition, then the obligation for the immigration to provide records regarding one's absence from the state must be mandatory. One may say that, that it might be onerous on the immigration authorities to do, I say, in this day and age of, of technology and AI, there must be a way to pull out those records. Not every single piece of record from the immigration office, but those records simply dealing with one's absence from the state or one's ins and outs if you are not resident in the state. There must be a way to do it and it should be mandatory as well. And again, I think doing that would help with the integrity of the list because we do not want a situation where 20 years down the line, 
we are back to the situation where we are right now and wanting to cleanse the voters list because we have this confirmation period, it's done, it's over with, and then nothing else happens after that. Yes, there is an onus on the political parties and civil society to object to persons on the list, but we all know the difficulties with that. How does one, how do, do I, if I wanted to object to someone on the list, how would I find out whether that person has been absent from the state or not? It's, it's almost impossible. And I believe that that might be the reason why there has never been an objection. There's no way for someone to really find out. The person who can really find out and mandate those records is the election um, office. Those are the people who can find out and the law should provide for them to find out and to receive those records mandatorily. In relation to the publication, we haven't reached there yet, Madam Chair, but the publication of the lists. Go ahead. Yes, we know that there is in the legislation inconsistency or gaps in relation to how the lists and registers are published and in some cases when they are published. So for example, section 15 of the Register of Electors Act, it says that the supplementary list says when, it says when it is to be published, but it doesn't say how. And then in the revised supplementary list, it says how it is to be published, that is in the Gazette and on the website, but it doesn't say when it is to be published. And this section, it says that it is to be published on the website, on the Gazette. But however, when we look in the regulations, they do not mandate publication of any list or register on the website. And we wonder why. Is there a security reason why it should not be published on the website? I'm not sure. In this day and age, the registers, the list should be published on the website. It's, to me, it is a, a straightforward matter. And I'm not sure why the regulations do not permit, permit that or do not mandate that. It says in the regulations that copies of the list should be made available in certain places and so on, and you get this, uh, the impression that it is a physical list, but this is passive. I'm not saying that it should not be made available. It must be made available, but it must also be made available on the website. That needs to be in the regulation. On the issue of ID cards, um, it appears, Madam Chair, that although the term national ID card is used in the proposed legislation, um, what the legislation, what the, the card legislated for, or the proposed legislation really legislates for is a voter ID card. I mean, I, I share the AG's opinion that it's a non-issue in the sense that, as Mr. Richards, Mr. Richards contends that the Electoral Commission does not have the jurisdiction to issue ni national ID cards, but the proposed legislation, what it's doing is really giving them jurisdiction to, is really giving them the power to issue voter ID card. So it calls it a national ID card, but what it says is you can only receive this card if you're registered to vote. So if you can only receive the card when you're registered to vote as a voter, how can it possibly be a national ID card? It is a voter registration card. It's a voter ID card. That's what it is. So I think that if that is what it is, let's call it what it is. Unless, of course, and Sir Byron is saying that for the national ID card to really take effect or to really have life, then there are other pieces of legislation that need to be passed together with it to give it life. And unless those pieces of legislation are there and ready to go on impending, then let's forget the idea. Let's just call it what it is. It's a voter ID card. Let's just, and all that requires is just switching out the name from national ID card to voter ID card. Unless, of course, we have those pieces of legislation there waiting, then let's see them and let's go with it. And if at all in the future we do have those pieces of legislation to give life to a national ID card, then it is a simple matter of going in and amending the legislation, if needs be. With the national ID card, again, I think that one of the important facts, what the surveys said, according to Sir Byron's report, and what people wanted to see on the national ID cards are the biometric data, and that the cards are updated periodically. And we wonder how the legislation really addresses these things. The legislation, it says at Regulation 13 that a national identification card issued pursuant to Regulation 10 3D shall be in the form as set out in Form 7 in the first schedule and shall be signed by the Chief Registering Officer and have such security features as the Chief Registering Officer considers appropriate. I don't think that that is sufficient. I think that that is very much in general terms. Yes, it gives the chief registering officer some flexibility, but it's not enough. It doesn't put in the basic things that people said that they wanted in the survey, which is some biometric data. 
your photograph. The legislation asks when you're confirming and when you're registering, it asks for your photograph. So if it asks for your photograph, it asks for your information, why not simply put it in the legislation, in the regulations, that at the minimum, your photo must be in the card. Okay, your photo must be on the card. Form 7 right now is blank. So we don't know what it's going to look like. It's blank right now. So in the very least, I think it needs to have that your, your, your face. It's an ID card, so it needs to have your face. And it needs to have, of course, your name, your voter ID, registration number, and your constituency. It needs to have those things, and I think the regulations need to see that these things need to be there as a minimum. And of course, still leaving the chief registering officer to decide anything else that he may require. And finally, on the issue of bribery and treating, um, one, as I said, one of the vexing issues has been the transportation of voters from outside of Dominica for the purpose of voting. Now, the law states that a corrupt intent has to be proven for this or any other action, for that matter, to be deemed bribery or treating. That is one of the most difficult things to prove. However, one of the, the functions of legislation, I think, is to clarify the law in relation to current issues and indeed to simply legislate for current pressing issues. If that has been identified as a current and vexing issue, the legislation needs to address it directly. Okay, it has been identified, the survey has said so, it is there. Or if the survey doesn't say so sufficiently, let's do another one to see, but I think the peti election petitions, the protests, etc., is sufficient evidence to show that it is a vexing issue in Dominica. And I think that the legislation just simply needs to address it directly. If it's not treating, say it's not treating. If it is, say it is. Or if it is, whether if you, if you don't want to call it treating, if you want to make it just unlawful, and I think that might be a, a solution to just simply make it unlawful to bring in voters or to pay for the passages of voters to come into Dominica to vote. So the legislation simply needs to address it. And I think that that is it for my part. I think there's a lot more to be said, and I think there's more to be said in relation to the, the funding of the Electoral Commission. The new act has provided for it, and there's some things to be said there as well. But I think time, <laughs> we'll leave it at that for now. Um, Madam Chair, before I go, is it possible at all? Right now, I think it is August, and several council are overseas, not present on vacation, because this is the time that most of them take their vacation, is during August, because the court is on vacation as well. And I wonder if it might not be possible at all that we can have another consultation. Or another way, I know you said that we can send in our written submissions, but um, many people expressed the view that the time was short and that the notice period as well was short. I mean, it wasn't even a week, you know, to, to give them a chance to really go into this thing and, and, and review it. So I wonder if we can have another consultation. I'm putting it out there, and it is for your consideration. Thank you very much. Just to go with your last point, um, I would leave that to government to decide <laughs> whether there would be further consultations, but I think the idea is to try to get as, um, as wide a consultation as possible. Um, as you, I, I think persons would have had access to those reports from June, uh, so um, there has been time, and, and one would have expected to be called to come to the consultations because the Prime Minister would have indicated that he was going to consult everybody. Um, so, but of course, you can still put, bring it, put in your um, written submissions. Um, if there is time, bearing in mind that we would want to get this legislation before Parliament uh, before the end of the year. So if there is sufficient time, depending on the scheduling, then um, that perhaps can be entertained. But um, I would leave that for government to, to decide on. You made mention of, uh, of um, the possibility of, of a committee being formed to go through it. The idea of having these consultations is to hear for, from as wide a cross-section of Dominica as possible so that everybody has the opportunity to, to express their views on what they think the electoral um, reform process should look like. Um, so you don't want to just restrict it to, us, to a small set of people. You need to have the views of as wide a cross-section as possible. 
in addition. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, fine. Um, and again, the government has not expressed its view yet on the report. This is Sir Dennis's report. So we don't know what the government agrees or does not agree with, what the position of the government is on this. The whole idea of this is to look at the report of Sir Dennis to see whether you agree or disagree, whether you think that there are certain things that should be included that's not included. So we, we do appreciate the, um, the, the suggestions that have been made, the, what you have pointed out. Um, all of those things are being recorded for them to be looked at. Um, and of course, we would encourage other persons as well to share their views on um, the recommendations that have been made as well and, and, and whether there are things in there that they think that are missing that might need to be included as well. Um, on the, the question of, of bribery and treating, uh, I think Sir Dennis has dealt with that in his report in terms of what the law is um, and what the law and, and how the courts have interpreted um, these sections. Um, there's numerous precedents in relation to that. Uh, so um, uh, one should bear that in mind. Um, and of course, um, I think in relation to the other things that has, been, that has been noted, I don't know if there's any other comments that anybody would have. Um, sorry, Madam Registrar, you would, want, you would like the floor? Sure. Do you want to speak from here or we have mics? Thank you very much.
that is well noted. I think Senior Council wants to, um, to, to come in as well. Senior Council has to fight. Yes, I, I do I, I do wish to come back. Let me start with it.
Is there anybody online who would want to make any comments on any aspect of Sir Dennis's um, report or in the room? Sorry. Yes. Um, please state your name so that the um, transcriber can take your name down, please. Colleen. Colleen, please stand. You wanted to sit. Uh, can we have the mic over here, please? Um, the president of the bar. Mrs. Knight DD. <laughs> <laughs>
somebody on the front here. Madam Chair, I see an eye for myself and every other lawyer who is not present. Madam Chair, regarding the broadcasting 